Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is really building on the theme of uh, the two sessions this morning, because I know or realize I've moved around, and the two themes are transcriptional dynamics and intracellular dynamics. So uh, I thought I'd try and put a talk together which actually reflected both of those, those aspects. And um, the, the theme that came to mind was uh, this topic here, which is uh, a topic close to my heart, uh, which is uh, root gravitropism. So, let me just quickly explain. So gravitropism, well, essentially I'm going to be talking about auxin regulated plant development. I love this picture, this is taken from a review by Bert de Reibel and Tom Beekman, and it really illustrates all the different processes in plants which are regulated by auxin. And we've heard about a number of these uh, this morning and over, I'm sure over the next, uh, the, these two days, uh, in the shoot, in the root, etc. Um, the actual uh, pathway which, which regulates this the known pathway can be summarized as follows, where auxin via its tier one receptor a targets degradation of this repressor protein, then we have activation of transcription and gene induction. And uh, this, obviously this pathway is, uh, can explain, uh, is relevant to many, many different processes through some very elegant work from Ottolines and, and, and Marx, originally uh, uh, laboratories and many others uh, who described the importance of these components and these processes. But uh, this is obviously a transcriptional-based network uh, where auxin is triggering changes in gene expression and by its very nature it's quite slow. If you think about transcription, by the time you actually need to induce transcription, the time you get translation, the time you get protein production, it's actually a relatively slow process and this is a topic I'd like to explore in today's talk. Particularly if you consider a process such as gravitropism, which is uh, Here's a movie and I'm going to give you some timelines. So essentially here we have a root which has been given a gravity stimulus. Within 10 to 20 minutes you see a change uh, in growth uh, back in this elongation zone. By about two hours you've got the full bend, uh, you're almost half through the bending. And by six hours you've completed uh, the bending response. So the question is, how relevant is this signaling pathway to this process? And that's really the question I'd like to, 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 to put up there in the air for you to consider in today's talk. And let me just summarise how genetics has really helped us understand uh, the gravitropic process. Uh, a great deal of work from uh, uh, Klaus Palmer, uh, from Yuji Frimmels, and hopefully from our uh, labs have contributed to understanding about this. So if gravitropism is driven by auxin, as I've indicated, and uh, so auxin accumulates at the tip of the root. And we know that the site of gravity sensing these root cap cells and some beautiful work that Yishi did uh, has uh, indicated the importance of this uh, auxin transporter called PIN3 and also recently in that very nice paper in, P uh, in PNAS, also PIN7 in the uh, redistribution of auxin at the tip of the plant. Um, the next phase uh, involves um, the actual uh, redistribution of auxin back from these sensing cells, back via the lateral root cap cells, and this is mediated by uh, auxin influx carriers such as aux1 and also the pin2 carrier here. And these play uh, the role in actually mobilizing the auxin back through the lateral cap and eventually to the responsive uh, tissue. So these are the cells which actually undergo the differential uh, cell expansion, uh, which give rise to the bending response. So the cells on the lower side, uh, uh, will, the cells will expand less versus the upper side, and so you'll have, uh, you, the net effect will be a bending response. And this, this response is, uh, this response phase is, is mediated by components of this network. Uh, and we know, for example, if we knock out two of these transcription factors, uh, RF7 and RF19, um, uh, that we can actually disrupt gravitropism. So clearly, um, this is a, a transcellular signaling process and it involves not only transport processes, but also uh, these key components. Now, one of the uh, problems uh, in terms of studying uh, this process is that genetic studies have been incredibly powerful to identify, help us identify the key components of this process. But we have to realize the limitations of what they, what they can do. And, and really, they provided uh, uh, essentially uh, qualitative uh, uh, insights into this whole process. But we lack information about uh, quantitative insights about the dynamics. And there are many dynamic uh, properties of this process which we, we still are ignorant of. And uh, for example, we still don't know, despite it being over 90 years, the, the, where this pathway is, this, this mechanism has been talked about, how rapidly the auxin gradient forms. We've no idea how long the asymmetry persists for, how the actual auxin distribution uh, returns to normal during uh, the, the bending response. 
And a question which I'd like to pose today is, uh, within this context of this formation of gradient, what are the dynamics of transcription? Now, this has been difficult up to now because, essentially, we've been relying on tools which are based on transcriptional reporters. So, we all uh, know and love this reporter based on DR5, which has been uh, fine-tuned uh, uh, by uh, many different workers, including Yishi. And you can see that, essentially, it will provide you an output uh, of this response uh, pathway. But if we want to monitor actual auxin gradients, uh, we, this is actually relatively slow and also the relationship between auxin and DR5 is not so clear. We want some, a sensor which is far more uh, responsive to auxin and, and Yan, I anticipate, may have spoken about this this morning. Okay, right. Well, essentially, Tiva Venu uh, in Yan's uh, uh, <coughs> group has actually uh, generated a new sensor. Well, in this context, if you generate a gradient uh, 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 with this, these behavior, these properties, what are the actual dynamics uh, of transcription can we detect? And uh, this, uh, we, we uh, performed this experiment by performing um, a micro dissection of root apices of gravity stimulated root tips and performed transcript profiling. And as you can see, uh, we see within a, a 60 minute period, we can see a transient increase uh, in a variety of auxin inducible genes. Um, and so this is the result in a detectable transcriptional output within this time scale. And the question is, uh, we can detect changes within 15 minutes of the transcription. So clearly the transcriptional changes are very rapid. But I suppose what, the, the question is, what, how, how quickly do we see changes in the protein abundance? So the, I suppose what I'm asking is, how quick is, is RNA export? How quick is uh, translation? And uh, to actually see the proteins accumulate and start to have an effect. <coughs> And uh, we did a simple experiment using these reporters to give us an idea of the time scale, again using quantification on the confocal. And you can see when we add auxin, we see a very rapid de de uh, decrease in the, the DT reporter. In parallel, if we measured the messenger RNA, the DR5 uh, report, you can see a very rapid induction consistent with the transcriptomics I've just described. So clearly, transcription, uh, auxin regulated transcription, uh, is very, very uh, rapid. But rather surprisingly, it takes a, a good two hours, two to three hours, to actually see changes in, uh, to see, to actually detect the protein, uh, this reporter. So clearly, uh, there's, a, there's a significant time delay between transcription and actual translation and, uh, and detection of the protein. And it's a, it's a surprisingly long period, uh, if you consider it. And this is consistent with our observations if we use these reporters. And this is a very nice report that was developed in Elliott's laboratory. Uh, and as you can see, uh, following a gravity stimulus, we don't see any changes until uh, after two hours. And as you can see, the root is, is halfway through bending. And it, we don't see the asymmetry, uh, the output, the response gradient, in this case, until three hours. And this is simply because of the, the time penalty, I suppose, placed on it uh, through um, uh, the fact that the translation appears to take such a long period. Now, this obviously suggests that for the changes in gene expression that we, we're, where the drugs are induced during a gravity response are not important in terms of how much protein is made um, within the first two hours. And so we, we, went, we wanted to test this idea um, by disrupting the two, to looking at the, 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 the behavior of the gravitropism of, of mutants which are disrupted in these two transcription factors. And I've mentioned transcription factor RF7 and RF19 are important. And so what we've done is look at these mutants in, in more detail. They've been described to be a gravitropic. And so what we did is use a new, some new software to tra actually track uh, the tip angle of, of roots. And we were surprised to actually see that, in fact, this, this mutant, which actually blocks transcription, uh, RF7, RF19, we know it does because we transcript profiled this as well as wild type during a gravitropic behavior. It, it clearly blocks uh, transcriptional induction. And when we measured the tip angles, you can see that it clearly is still responsive uh, to uh, the roots can still reorient. The kinetics, at least during the initial phases, are almost identical to uh, the wild type, but obviously clearly there's a tail off later on. But these initial kinetics are, are, are in the first period are actually quite similar. And this really makes us start to think about um, the whole process of how important transcription is for these very rapid res initial responses. Um, this would suggest, okay, I need to stop this movie. There we go. Uh, it doesn't disrupt uh, 
Blocking oxygen-induced transcription doesn't disrupt gravid root gravitropic curvature. In fact, uh, so in the absence of transcription, the roots can still bend. So this suggests that this pathway here is not, assen not essential for this rapid oxygen uh, response. In fact, there must be other processes which don't involve uh, this nuclear signaling. And this is so-called non-genomic responses, a phrase that Gigi uh, described, used to describe in a paper a few years ago. And this would suggest that oxygen actually uh, is required to trigger these rapid responses through this non uh, a pathway which is independent of this oxygen uh, signaling pathway. And uh, recently, uh, papers from Yuji's lab and others have suggested that uh, the role of ABP1 uh, in this process, and there is some genetic evidence uh, from another tumor laboratory uh, uh, which actually describes uh, possible gravitropic defects uh, during gravitropism, root gravitropism. So, this actually I think we have to rethink the way we think about the kinetics of, uh, uh, of oxygen response, at least for rapid oxygen responses, that it, actually non-genomic responses are likely to be more, um, more important. So the, the next question I'd like to ask is what triggers the formation of this lateral oxygen gradient? We can see that it form, is formed very rapidly. And um, we know from a great deal of work uh, on genetics that, um, that these, uh, these statoliths, which are found within these, these, these gravity sensing cells, are actually uh, 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 move in response to a gravity stimulus. Here's a lovely paper ta uh, uh, movie taken from a paper in plant cell by Andrew Stiles' lab, where they actually monitored um, the actual redistribution of these statoliths onto the lower side of columella cells. And uh, we know that this is important for the generation of this gradient. Uh, we've taken the D2 report, and here we have a, an image of confocal slice through the D2 report. You can see the gradient forming on this side and not on this side. And if we knock out the, uh, the, uh, the gene that actually results in the starch deposition, the starch that actually makes these organelles heavy and allow them to sediment, if we knock this, uh, this starch synthase gene out, uh, phosphoglucomutase, we can actually uh, alter the the, 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 the statoliths, and as you can see, we can block the formation of the gradient. So clearly these statoliths are important for the initial uh, formation of this auxin gradient. And um, the question is, what is the, what's more interesting is how on earth do we get this, we have this very rapid increase, but we also see this very rapid drop off. And what's the basis for the reversal of this auxin asymmetry? And it's likely, um, if you actually, instead of mapping this against time, but actually mapping against root angle, you can see that about 40 degrees, we see this very, this, 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 this uh, shift, um, we loss of the gradient at the midpoint of uh, bending. And we, we thought about this, and um, you'd anticipate the gradient actually may be triggered by uh, the same mechanism that triggers the initial formation is also maybe trigger the, uh, re the, the loss of the gradient. And uh, as I've described, statoliths are important for this process. And so we've been busy tracking statoliths uh, and their behaviours. Um, and here we have a, a simple movie which describes this. So essentially what happens when we give a root a 90 degree stimulus, you get the, uh, they move to the lower side. At 40 degrees, what we observe is the statoliths actually re move back in what we call the tipping point mechanism. So statoliths essentially appear to function like tilt switches and they allow you to uh, um, allow the cells to actually understand what is, uh, wh where gravity is actually acting. And so we think that roots employ a tipping point mechanism when they're stimulated uh, by 90 uh, degrees. And obviously this is very important when you think about processes like germination where the root needs to reorient in response to uh, the, the root, the seedling doesn't know exactly which direction it's respond, which is positioning. And so obviously the root needs to uh, be able to grow downwards for the seedling establishment. But some work we've been doing uh, recently uh, using micro CT imaging uh, it's clear that actually, when you actually track Arabidopsis roots in soil, that the actual the roots rarely have a, a, a gravity stimulus uh, uh, such so extreme unless, for example, it may hit an object. And so we, we were puzzled by this. So how do roots actually sense stimuli which are less than, uh, which are less than 90 degrees? And uh, so we thought long and hard about this. And we think it's actually down to the geometry of the, of the columella. And we've been doing uh, some modeling work, and I'd like just to describe some of this work. Uh, so essentially, here we have, um, here we have uh, uh, the uh, PIN3 uh, protein, which we've used to mark the, the, uh, the, to mark the actual columella cells. And if we actually uh, use uh, segmentation uh, techniques, these are ways to actually take an image and then extract uh, the cell outline, the cell volumes. 
and we can use this in, in a three-dimensional sense, we can actually start to understand the roles of the different cell files. What we've done is we've combi we're combining um, these three-dimensional uh, images of the columella to capture the geometries of the cells. We're also combining it with um, uh, engineering models where we're actually seeing sedimentation of these statoliths. And so what we're doing is, um, here we go, see if this fires off. We're taking this col the columella and actually giving these cells different uh, gravity stimuli. And we're also looking at the behavior of the sedimentation of particles within uh, these cells. And to understand exactly how the, the cells are behaving, ha behaving in response to different uh, angles. And currently, we, uh, our current model uh, for these low angle stimuli appears to involve a role for these cells on the side of the, of, of the columella. Columella are actually made of four different columns. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the cells in the central file are rather uh, uh, square-like, but the cells on the, on the outer side have a distinct cell uh, angle. And we think that this actually may provide the basis. So these, these actual cells may be, uh, trigger statolith uh, movements uh, um, in, uh, at lower angles. And this, we think, is, this is all that's required to actually trigger a redistribution of PIN3, uh, these carriers, uh, and so we'll create a gradient of, uh, of auxin through the activities of just a subset of these files. And we think that this uh, could provide a, an explanation for such a low angle response. Now, what we're trying to do is to actually capture this, and this is some more software that generated a CPIP called CellSet, and this allows you to actually quantify and position uh, where pin lo location is in relative to cell wall markers. And as you can see, uh, even from confocal images, it's difficult to make a call about the localization, in this case, of pin. But when we actually use the software, we can very clearly see which side the pin is in terms of the cells. And we can actually use this to quantify uh, gravity-induced redistribution. So this, these studies are ongoing at the present. We're taking this information and dialing it into some beautiful software developed by uh, Christoph Godin's lab in Montpellier called OpenAlia. And this is really nice uh, vertex-based model which allows you to, to actually code in exactly the, the directions of oxygen transport or within the route. And uh, this, I'll just show you a very simple uh, uh, simulation. So what we've been working closely with Christoph's group uh, where we've been, at, uh, we've been taking uh, the OpenAlia framework and, and putting in models, which ordinary differential equation models, which capture the transport, production, decay, and binding of the response networks. So these are, these are networks which contain, which contain uh, the majority of, of, of processes which are of interest to, to uh, this uh, gravitropism. And as you can see, we can, get, we can make predictions about the distribution of auxin and various signaling components uh, from uh, these simulations. And this is where uh, uh, the D2 reporter really comes in beautifully to actually validate these predictions. So, for example, in this prediction, we, we, we predict that auxin is going to be accumulating uh, primarily in these epi elongating epidermal cells, which are post the lateral root cap. And it's very pleasing that you can see here we have uh, D2, and you can see that after the lateral root cap, indeed, D2 venous actually drops off, consistent with the accumulation of auxin in this case. So uh, the marriage between these two different formats is extremely powerful. So in sum, just to summarize, I'd like to say that D2 Venus provides a very nice sensor for monitoring rapid changes in auction response and distribution. And we've, we're focusing very much now on developing means to actually do this at the cellular level resolution, what I've talked about to now essentially our groups of cells, but we're developing ways to actually develop uh, cellular res levels of resolution with the reporter. As I've described, um, uh, we've demonstrated that it can be used as a quantitative reporter to monitor auction abundance in planter. And we've, it's been extremely useful to actually help us to demonstrate the auxin gradient forms within minutes of gravity stimulus. This formation is dependent on statoliths in the columella cells. So the gradient only exists for the first half of the root bending response, and that the loss of the gradient occurs at the tipping point of statoliths. And this, the auxin induced transcription, uh, is surprisingly, is not required for initial root bending. In fact, it's actually required after the, the, the midpoint is reached. Uh, and we, we uh, predict that non-genomic auxin signaling mechanisms much, must exist to initiate this root gravitropic bending response. And uh, this work is, uh, couldn't have been done without a really extensive collaboration. 
This involved a multidisciplinary team of biologists, mathematicians, computer scientists and imaging, uh, image analysts at CPIB. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank very much uh, the excellent collaboration we've had with Tiva Venu and Yann Trass at, in Lyon, uh, with Inria in Montpellier, uh, Christophe Godin, and also the transcriptomics I described was done by a joint student with Chris Fissenberg, Ethel Sato in my lab. And the tip tracker we actually uh, is a collaboration with a university in Pakistan. Uh, this guy works on um, uh, looking at angles of intercontinental uh, missile ballistics. So, uh, <laughs> isn't it great that we can use uh, some of that, some of that uh, uh, <laughs> military expenditure for something keep, useful? Keep him busy on route. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And finally. Uh, 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 I know that Ruth wouldn't, would, not uh, would not forgive me for not giving this a plug. Uh, Susie asked me also to do this, so can I encourage people to submit uh, problems to this Mathematics in Plant Science Study Group? This is co-organised by Garnet and CPIB. It's in its fifth incarnation. Uh, this basically brings together models and plant scientists, and so 40 mathematicians give up their time. They come from all over the country to tackle plant science problems. And uh, the, the previous four meetings have been a great success. It's generated grant proposals. Uh, which, uh, which have brought in uh, multi-million pound uh, 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 awards, put a number of publications to studentships. It's going to take place just after January and they're looking for problems and if you're interested, please can you contact Susie or Ruth uh, at this address. So thank you very much for your attention. I suppose you need a transcription to sustain the bending, right? So. So which, which part of the initial response doesn't require transcription according to you? Well, cl well clearly based on, on the tip, tip tracking of, uh, of, of the R7, R19, the, the initial Benham response is clearly independent of that. And uh, so there must be a means of auxin to actually to cause changes, physiological changes. Um, and obviously there's a great deal of old work about uh, the impact on proton pumps uh, which was described in the 70s and 80s, uh, which could provide a mechanism, but it still doesn't address how does auxin, how is auxin sensed in, say, the agroplast, where it, the gradient is likely to hit first. Um, and so obviously the work you've done on ABP1 is really interesting in that sense. It suggests that ABP1 is, is functioning in the agroplast, but there must be some mechanism for ABP1 to translate that into uh, uh, physiological changes in, say, the cell wall. You know, if you're getting bending within 10 to 20 minutes, You've got, to base, you've got to be affecting the physiological process directly. You're not going via transcription, translation, and trafficking. This has really got to be happening very, very rapidly. Okay, so I will simplify. So how do you know that this initial bending is auxin-dependent if you say it's not auxin-mediated transcription-dependent? Well, if you actually knock, knock out, from, we know from Newton's work, uh, that if you mark, knock out the auxin moving from the columella back to the elongation zone, you don't get a bending response. And so there's been some very nice work recently by Simon Gilroy's lab which shows that the pH changes and the calcium changes which uh, are, are associated with, with gravitropic curvature within the first few minutes are entirely dependent on auxin and aux1. So essentially, that initial process the initial bending response is driven by auxin. Uh, and if you use NPA, will you stop these early responses? I don't know about that. I don't know because um, clearly our, our, the reporter we're using is, 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 is a nuclear localised reporter. And so we, don't have a, 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 we obviously don't have a reporter for auxin responses in, say, in the apoplast. So uh, uh, you'd, you'd imagine that it would. I mean, NPA is known to block uh, gravitropism. Uh, we need to do a detailed tip tracker uh, experiment with NPA. It's a good point. It's a good point. Thank you.